Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running and nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, I hope that you're doing well and you are ready for today's program. So today on the show, we have, well, computer and technology news, and that's brought to you by Computer America. Tons of different stories, looking here, about 15 different ones, and you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. We have everything from gaming to news to uh, current events, and hey, there's going to be a lot to talk about and we're looking forward to discussing that with you. So everyone, let's go ahead and just get started with ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including past shows, future shows, everything you need to know. Everything's up there. Uh, over the weekend, we were able to catch up. By the way, uh, we hope that all of you had a great 4th of July and you, uh, yeah, you know, and everything's going well because, hey, it was a long weekend for us here at Computer America, but uh, we're happy that you are able to join us again. Uh, yeah, and again, check out the website. It has links to social media. has links to all the podcasts. uh has links to the YouTube, all that kind of thing. Computer America should be um, should be everywhere. So hey, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and get started with computer and technology news brought to you by Computer America. All right, so I think that our first story that we're going to do is actually going to be something uh, pretty easy to understand, and this is going to be, well, an update. And this update has to do with Chrome. Uh, Chrome is pretty notorious for being a power-hungry monster, if you let it get that way. Uh, it can take up all of your memory. It's, uh, you know, it, it can be very insidious in how it takes up all the resources. On your machine, if left unchecked, well, turns out that uh, there's an update. And depending on what laptop you have and obviously use case and that kind of thing, this update could save you about two hours battery life. That's right. It could extend the battery life of your laptop by about two hours with this new Chrome update. And I'm glad that they're finally getting around to it because it's been such a long running joke and it's, uh, you know, it's been addressed in a couple of different ways, but it still has a lot of work to do. And I'm glad that Google is finally getting around to it. So Chrome still has a reputation as a battery hog, partic particularly if you tend to open many, many tabs. And I've seen some of those worst case scenarios where some people, they never close a tab in their life. If you ever want to immediately improve the performance of your machine, uh, find that friend with three, four, five, sometimes 10,000 tabs, I've seen it before, uh, and close all of them <laughs> because at that point you're just doing it because you're lazy you're not there's no actual productivity that could actually flow from your well workflow 
by having hundreds of different tabs open. But I digress. The Windows Club understands that an experimental feature in Chrome 86 will reduce energy by shutting down unnecessary JavaScript timers and trackers when a tab is in the background. By the way, if anyone out there is using Chrome, actually we just did a uh, we just did an article the other week saying that Chrome has officially hit 70% market share. So yeah, a lot of you are using Chrome. So if you uh, if you use Chrome, there is an add-on that you can get, and I believe it's called the Great Suspender. And I highly recommend it. It's an add-on. It's free. Obviously, you can donate to it if you really appreciate what they do. But yeah, the Great Suspender. If you have tabs in the background that you haven't interacted with in about 30 minutes, it will put them in kind of like a, well, a suspended state. And you can, you know, it's just one click to get it back up and running exactly where you were. But it's, uh, yeah, you know, if you have to have those tabs open, then that is a great alternative. So with that being said, this is going to be baked in with Chrome 86 update. And they said that uh, the savings could be significant in the right circumstances. Reportedly, Google saved two hours of battery life in a test with 36 background tabs and one blank foreground tab. Extreme conditions, but not far-fetched. 36, uh, obviously here for the show and what we're doing, I'm looking at uh, about 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 different tabs open at once, obviously for what we do here with the show. And, you know, we're just getting started. It's not even, you know, hey, this isn't even my final form. So there you go. Uh, They said that the gains weren't as dramatic when playing YouTube video, but more intensive tests still added about 36 minutes of runtime. So some kind of energy savings with this, and it's not a small amount. This is a decent chunk of, uh, of battery life saved. Uh, and, and even if you don't have, you know, kind of a battery to worry about, if you're on a desktop computer or you're plugged into the wall, even that, let's face it, we should all do our best to be as efficient as possible. And if for no other reason than you update your Chrome and this becomes a thing, everyone saves that much electricity. And again, a billion plus people use Chrome, um, yeah, there. This is going to save a lot of electricity in the long run, even for desktop users. Uh, they said that this uh, this is only available as a flag in early Chrome 86 builds, though it would be available for all desktop and mobile versions. There's no guarantee that it'll be ready for the new version of Chrome, and if there's a cha- and of course there's a chance that it could get scrapped. Uh, that chance I think will be very very small because they have to make sure it works in all conditions. And they said that if it does ship, though, it could address a common complaint among laptop users and companies like Apple and Microsoft have touted battery life over Chrome. That's something that Microsoft with their edge that was the claim to fame because they couldn't have anything else. Uh, Speed and uh, battery life and battery efficiency when it came to the Microsoft Edge browser. I think that all these companies, you know, if you want people to save electricity, it shouldn't be up to the individual. Uh, Instead of getting, you know, hundreds of millions of people to all be more energy conscious, it's so much easier to just make more efficient code and make more efficient, uh, make more efficient applications. And hey, that's what they did. So it's pretty, pretty darn nice. They said that, uh, yeah, so that should be coming out. They said this looks like the 86 build. I'm trying to think right now and actually look at my Google right now. And we should be on 84, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, your current iteration, that's when everyone else is on the stable build. And then there's like the canary in the coal mine kind of, you know, here's kind of the cutting edge, what we're definitely going to be bringing out. And then they have one iteration even beyond that, that is completely experimental, use at your own risk, that kind of thing. So, I, you know, I'm trying to see and I can't, let's see, it's probably here. Yeah, uh, we're on 83 right now, actually. So 83, 84 is that, you know, kind of here's what's coming, but you get it first. Uh, 85 is that super experimental and looks like 86 is, I guess, even the playground for that. So uh, a couple of weeks, couple of months, we'll definitely know if it finally makes the light and we'll be sure to let you know to update your Chrome browser. Although you should update everything. That's super important. 
there you go. Story number one, pretty easy, pretty simple. Nothing too hard to think about there. Let's talk about a Supreme Court decision. And this does affect, obviously, technology in a lot of ways, but it does strike down one of the slim, slim hopes that robo robocallers had to continue peppering your phone. And I'm glad that they were able, or I'm glad that they were, that they lost this court case. So this is definitely a good thing for all consumers out there who do not like robocalls. So hopefully everyone. Um, yeah, so the, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld a federal ban on robocalls to mobile phones, rejecting a bid to topple the law on free speech grounds. That's right. They tried to use the First Amendment freedom of speech to get the ability to spam your, your phones once again. And by the way, we're pulling this from Bloomberg Law and uh, Greg Sto uh, Stower. As part of the splintered ruling, the court broadened the 1991 measure, tossing out a 2015 ex exception for calls made to collect debt owed to the federal government. Writing that the court's lead opinion, uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, said that the exception favors speech made for collecting government debt over political and other speech, rendering it constitutionally suspect. So the ruling is a defeat for political groups that had sought, that had sought a new avenue for campaign activity in the months leading up to the November election and the challengers, which included the Oregon Democratic Party and Washington State Democratic Central Committee, sought to overturn the entire robocall ban. But Kavanaugh said that the court would strip out the government exception without tossing out the ban entirely. So a little bit of a refinement of the 1991 Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Uh, they said that uh, they would strip out the government exception without tossing out the ban. Constitutional litigation is not a game of gotcha against Congress where, where litigants can ride a discrete constitutional flaw in a statute to take down the whole otherwise constitutional statute. Uh, yeah, the ruling upholds the decision of federal appeals court, and they defend the ban along with the government exception. And here we have the cases Barr versus America Association of Political Consultants. So the meat of it, if you're wondering all that, what does it mean, Ben? What does it mean? Here it is right here. The, uh, the 1991 Telephone Consumer Protection Act imposes a liability of $1,500 for any call or text placed to a mobile phone without prior consent using an automatic dialing system or artificial or pre-recorded voice. So every time you get one of those auto-dialed pre-recorded messages, and trust me, a lot of people get them, technically, technically, and I actually remember doing this article uh, a couple of months ago, each one of those calls is about, um, well, is $1,500. They're, they're supposed to be fined for $1,500. And the thing is, they, they being Congress, Congress passed a law that increased that fine from $1,500. I think now it's sitting at, um, yeah, that $1,500 is now sitting at, or I'm sorry, it was raised to $1,500 or something like that, or they proposed like $5,000 from $1,500. The problem is that uh, they've only collected, and I want to say, like even though they're owed, $2.1 billion in fines and fees and penalties and all that good stuff. They've only collected, I want to say, about $5,100, like total. And the reason for that is the obvious. A lot of these robocalling services, they are, they are pop-ups. I mean, think about it. Uh, it makes huge news whenever one of them is brought down, such as the one down in Miami. They, call him, they called him the kingpin of robocalls, and he was making millions of robocalls a day. And they finally got him, I think he got like 30 years in jail or something like that. But if one person can set up a system that is making millions a day, there's you know, there, there's no wonder why uh, American consumers are receiving multiple billion robocalls a year. 
it's a very big problem. It's very hard to solve and increasing fines. I mean, these fines that are there great when you finally are able to get your hands on one of these people that or one of these corporations, people, whoever's making these, these robocalls. If you can finally do that, then you're very grateful that these books or these laws are on the books. But actually getting your hands on them, eh, that's, uh, that's a whole nother thing. So there you go. Let's go ahead and um, yeah, let's go ahead and continue on here. So robocall ban upheld. That's a good thing. I, I really do think that robocall banning and the fines associated with them, even though they really don't do that much, uh, they should still be there. So that's definitely good. Um, okay, let's go ahead and, and continue on here. This next story. This next story is going to be about virtual reality. But more specifically, PlayStation virtual reality. Check this one out. Sony virtual reality patent describes technology that displays advertisements within headsets. Ah, and man, the the technology is still new. People are and by people, I mean developers. Developers are still trying to find a way to monetize virtual reality because it's not easy. It, it, it really isn't, you know, for, for this technology to be a commercial, uh, a commercial success, people are going to want to have to advertise in them or around them or through them in some mean. And right now there's so many things being prohibitive with virtual reality. I would be surprised if something like this actually came to fruition. So this was published yesterday, and it looks like the patent was actually filed back in 2018, but published late last month. The idea is illustrated in the image above, and if you're just listening to the radio, think of a rectangle. The rectangle, of course, being your field of view. The game would be this oval that takes up the vast majority, 90% of the image is the game image, but then that last... Uh, 10% of the image that is, you know, not directly involved in the game, but just slightly in the peripheral would be an advertisement. So the obvious problem there is it's a little subliminal. It's, it's almost, uh, you know, just thinking about McDonald's always in the corner of your mind. It's, uh, it gets a little spooky. It gets a little weird, but yeah, they're looking for ways to monetize. Obviously, not everything that we talk about here today is going to make it in the end product of all these products, but it really goes to show that you know someone's sitting at home saying, oh, they know exactly how this is going to go. No, even Sony, probably the biggest seller of virtual reality equipment, even they don't know how to fully monetize this system. Your guess is as good, or at least in this case, better probably than what Sony has to come up with. So the abstract, where they describe the technology, a line of sight direction detection detects a direction. That's a fun sentence to say. A line of sight direction detection detects a direction of a line of sight of a user wearing a head mounted display. So essentially what they're saying there to break down that sentence would be they're, they can tell where you're looking. The main image generated section generates a first image regarding main content selected by the user as an item to be displayed on the heads up display. That means whatever you decide the content is, be it a video game, a video, uh, whatever you're, whatever it is you're trying to consume will be the first image loaded and the primary image on the screen. They said that a display control section causes the head mounted display to display a second image regarding content different from the main content for promoting recognition of a given thing or service together with the first image. So the first image is processed and put in front of you, but then of course the secondary image is put around it and well, is an ad. The display control section controls a manner in which the second image is displayed on the head mounted display in accordance with the direction of the user's line of sight. So it will track itself based on your line of sight. Uh, it will never become the primary thing. It will simply be on the peripheral. 
Sony used the example of a concert with several performers. The technology would be uh, would be able to detect the performer has the user attention and then display an advertisement in accordance with the performers of uh, with the performer of interest. Uh, Sony considers the new marketing technique whereby advertisements are displayed in both virtual reality and augmented reality spaces. The application argued that there, there is currently no effective method of displaying additional content in VR and AR spaces and that this technology aims to solve that problem. As usual, take note that the patents don't always come to fruition and are merely ideas that the company is toying with. And I think that should be, that should be the real takeaway here. In my mind, this will never see the light of day. It's just not a very effective way. And like something that Sony s said there, um, you know, because it, it costs almost nothing to patent an idea. Um, it will cost you everything if you fail to patent an idea that becomes something useful later on down the road. So they can patent anything that they want, uh, even if they have no, in, uh, no intentions of actually using it. So my point here is that that part that they said there, saying that there is no, currently there is no effective method of displaying additional content in VR and AR spaces. That's a very important line because augmented reality and virtual reality especially virtual reality, you know, augmented reality that you could kind of argue that there's a place, uh, think about billboards and things like that. We already have those in real life that they take you away from whatever, whatever it is you're doing. And they're putting images in front of your face. But the problem with virtual reality is that in a lot of cases you are given an alternate reality and you could probably implement ads in a way depending on the type of game if it's a driving game think of uh, something like a nascar event in virtual reality you can display advertisements just like you do at a real nascar event uh if it's at a concert you could display advertisements just like you would at a concert or a movie theater just like you would at a movie but for a video game that is strictly trying to put you in a entire different, let's say post-apocalyptic, uh, Half-Life Half Alex type setting, there's no way to put in an ad that's not obtrusive and takes you out of it. Because if it's post-apocalyptic, odds are, um, you know, Coca-Cola is probably not going to be advertising right there in the game so there's a right way to do this there's a wrong way to do this and if you try to shoehorn this into every experience even sony knows this if you try to shoehorn this into every experience it would not work uh you know having even your peripheral vision compromised would take you out of what virtual reality is really meant to do which is again Im immerse you in something so it's um this probably won't happen, but it does go. But like I said earlier, it does go to show that they are really thinking hard. That virtual reality is still a thing; it's still a thing that they need to prepare for. And whoever comes up with the best monetization scheme is going to have the best chance of becoming the the superior platform. So, there you go. It's. Uh, I hope that this never becomes a thing, but there you have it. So there's that article. Uh, that's article number three. So, so article number four that we're going to do. I took exception to this one. And this is from the National Interest, a publication that we normally don't really uh, talk about. But they're talking about a very important issue that we have even addressed here on the show before. And strides are being made but at the same time it's not a problem that you can fix overnight and it's not a problem that is uh you know that is completely won overnight either so this has to do with education in china but not chinese education rather china's education in comparison to the united states education when it comes to mathematics uh 
so many companies and so many different applications for technology are rooted in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, as we know, or machine learning, is really not that complicated, but to develop better AI, that's where it gets really complicated. The research arm of artificial intelligence is something that is super, super hard to do. And you need qualified people to not just work on work on these programs, but qualified people to direct them and to actually improve what AI can do and can do for not just companies and organizations, but the government, the military, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Sorry, really, it's a matter of it's a matter of national security and national interest. Uh, just like you know, rocket technology, just like having space capabilities, just like having any kind of strong military, artificial intelligence has so much promise. And whoever develops the better artificial intelligence, uh, it would not be it would not be improper to call this an arms race, except for AI. And so here we have this article here, once again, from the National Interest. Uh, goes on for a bit, but we'll try to get to the meat of it. The race for AI supremacy has become perhaps the most visible aspect of the great power competition between America and China. The world's dominant AI power will have the ability to shape global finance, commerce, telecommunications, war fighting, and computing. President Donald Trump... Uh, of course, he recognized this last February by signing the executive order uh, designed to protect U.S. leadership in key AI technologies. In just a few years, American corporations, university think tanks, and government have devoted hundreds of policy papers and projects to addressing this challenge. I recall the uh, the president signing the American AI initiative, and that had to do with the fact that China could not use any software derived from an American company. And that affected the likes of Microsoft, Google, Apple, so on and so forth. It was a huge blow to the Chinese technology system. But it also has to do with the fact that um, America didn't want to give... China the leg up by letting them utilize American companies and then kind of springboard off of the work that was already being done by America and then getting even further ahead. Uh, the side effect was, of course, a further kind of not escalation, but a further distancing between American operating systems and American programming and American uh, products and services and the products and services used by everyday Chinese people. And I think at some point, China even promised to completely move away from Microsoft, let's say, for instance, which is an American company. Of course, there's one point, almost 1.3 billion people, or I'm sorry, almost 1.4 billion people in China that could have been potential customers of an American company that are now looking at a completely Chinese dominant market within China itself. So there are good aspects, there are bad aspects, but it did lead to this kinds of or this kind of arms race. So now let's go ahead and talk about how math kind of works into all this. They, uh, this article says that it's all about the math and America is failing to train enough citizens in the right kinds of mathematics to remain dominant. AI is not simply a black box that will grow if unlimited funds are poured into it, which I think a lot of people kind of mistake it for. Dozens of think tank projects and government reports won't mean anything if America can't maintain mastery over the fundamental mathematics that underpin AI. Calls for billions of dollars and related investments won't add up without the abstract math ability needed to transform the economy or military. And by the way, this actually uh, sums this up pretty well. What we call AI is in fact a very uh, is in fact a suite of various algorithms and distinctive developments that draw heavily from advanced mathematics and, and statistics. 
take deep neural networks, which have understandably become a CTO buzzword. As an example, these are not artificial brains that are stacked. Uh, they're, I'm sorry, they're not artificial brains. They're instead stacks of information transforming modules that learn by repeatedly computing a chain of which of what are known gradients which are the backbone of a family of algorithms known as backpropagation. So uh, similar dissections can be made of all machine learning and the study of how the program and how to program computers to learn a task rather than execute a pre-coded code, the ability to rapidly classify massive amounts of data, identify patterns, predict outcomes, and self-learn all come down to ever more sophisticated algorithms paired with increasingly powerful computational power in a commensurate amount of data. Yeah, that's why you have artificial intelligence. It's not an actual intelligence that, you know, you're not going to have to start apologizing for what you say to, uh, you know, your digital assistant. No, it's more artificial intelligence because these computers are writing the code themselves. Instead of someone having to sit there and having to write tons of different logic gates and loops and if and or statements and whatever other kind of JavaScript you can think of, these programs are defining the parameters themselves and they are teaching themselves how to best accomplish a task. But of course, to set all that up to Make sure that the data that you put in so that you get a really good outcome is all clean and sanitized and ready to go is going to take a ton of math. And then, of course, the math itself to make sure that the code that is learning doesn't have any flaws or anything wrong with it, which up until this point, everything does. Um, yeah, that takes a lot of math. So with that being said. They said that, unfortunately, America's American secondary schools and university students are not mastering the fundamental math that prepares them to move into the type of advanced fields, such as statistical theory and differential geometry, that makes AI possible. American 15-year-olds score 35th in math on the OECD's 2018 program, well below the OECD average. There you go. Even, the, even at the college level, not having mastered the basics needed for rigorous training in abstract problem solving, American students are often mostly taught to memorize algorithms and insert them when needed. Though, that has kind of always been the way that you teach to uh, teach students, at least for as long as I've been in, in education, is that you teach to a standard, you teach to a... Uh, you teach to a test and teachers for so long have been advocating against that. Instead, instead of showing mastery, it shows memorization and a much better way would be to teach concepts and not problems. Uh, the alternative is that, Hey, when you teach concepts instead of problems, it's very hard to assess how good you're doing on a massive scale. You know, if uh, comparing a 96 to a 90 on a test score is very, very simple, whereas, oh, they have a very good grasp of the fundamentals, that's much harder to test for and much harder to kind of teach to. So it's, uh, I have seen this and I, I've noticed this personally firsthand as well. It's not ideal, but hey, when you're teaching to a standard, to a test, it's what's going to happen. So this failure to train students capable of, of advanced mathematics means fewer and fewer U.S. citizens are moving on to advanced degrees in math and science. Uh, they said in 2017, over 64% of PH candidates and nearly 70% of master's students in U.S. computer science programs were foreign nationals and fully half of doctoral degrees in mathematics were non-U.S. citizens. Hmm. And that is according to the National Science Foundation. Chinese and Indian students across uh, students account for the bulk of these in large part because the most advanced training in American universities still outstrips that in part of their home countries. Though they say the gap is closing in China, I gotta say, personally, and uh, my brother is in academia, uh, 
you know, kind of in the higher end of it. And I do have to kind of refute some of this. Uh, I'm not saying that there aren't Chinese and Indian students who are super motivated and really making sure that they are getting the best education that they possibly can. But these foreign national students that come over to America for American doctorates, a lot of them come from not so reputable institutions that will award them a bachelor's degree or some kind of, or I'm sorry, or some kind of degree that they will give them straight A's, perfect test scores, uh, amazing credentials, at least on paper, but then the students themselves are actually very ill-equipped to deal with mathematics and, or I'm sorry, to, to deal with the PhD um, environment. And sometimes they don't get through on their own merits. It happens all the time. It is a huge problem in academia. Uh, the problem of integrity and making sure that everyone's credentials before they even get there are all actually true. And when they say that China is catching up to America, I truly believe that America is still teaching the best. Like obviously the article said that that's why American universities are still much, much better than any other university in the world. I, it's just hard for actual passionate American students to compete with someone who is, you know, maybe coming from it from another country, tons of money. And at the same time saying, Hey, I have, I've, I've had straight A's since I was two years old and I scored a perfect test on everything, including a perfect blood test. Uh, it's, it's not, e you know, universities want to, obviously, if they're seeking doctoral students and doctoral candidates, they want to accept the people with the best credentials, even if those credentials are falsified. So something to definitely take note of, uh, I don't think the gap is as wide as uh, this article would make it out to be. Still, there are good reasons to argue that U.S. visa restrictions on skilled workers should be eased, tempting uh, more of those foreign nationals to stay in the United States after their studies have been completed. But the bottom line is that not enough American citizens are choosing ma uh, to major in advanced mathematics, which is corresponding uh, which has corresponding implications for everything from foreign competition to Silicon Valley startup culture, from national security concerns to whether or not the U.S. corporations consider themselves American. Um, yeah, I, again, I point back to integrity, and I think that uh, there's a lot of dishonesty going on in not just not just academies and universities and places like that, but also in the job market as well. So yeah, there, I, I, there's much better numbers that we, that we could be taking from this whole thing. So China's AI market is now estimated to be worth about $3.5 billion. And Beijing has set a goal by 2030 of 1 trillion won AI market or about $142 billion dollars so in the next 10 years, they're hoping to increase their, their revenue concerning AI by $140 billion. The government has pledged the equivalent of $2.1 billion to build an AI industrial park outside Beijing. And uh, another major investment leading the effort is Huawei, which has established AI research laboratories in London and Singapore, unveiled a new generation of AI processor chips, and laid out an all-scenario AI strategy. Though Huawei, uh, to an American audience, it's very hard to really encapsulate just how big Huawei is. Uh, there's an article that we will get to a little bit later concerning Huawei and how the UK is actually looking to completely take Huawei out of their system, but that's almost impossible for a lot of other countries because Huawei makes 90% of the 5G antennas available in the world. And then on top of that, they do make a lot of phones and a lot of computer chips, mobile chips, mobile processors, things like that. It's, uh, 
Yeah, it, it's hard to overstate just how influential Huawei is, but at the same time, they are losing a lot of their influence because of a number of factors, uh, a number of them political. So uh, going through here, the article continues on for a bit. Uh, China's AI focus has global security implications as well. They're, they have military civil fusion policy, which mandates that all high-tech advancements be made available to the Chinese armed forces for incorporation into weapon systems. Okay, <laughs> pause it right there for one second. China and their corp corporations do tend to kind of be linked arm in arm. Uh, if there is any kind of backdoor that needs to happen to its users' data or anything like that, th a company will not be allowed to exist if they didn't consent to these policies. So it's not even like, you know, there's that one Chinese tech company that is just, you know, shirking all of the rules and, you know, maintaining privacy and things like that. No, the company would not be allowed to exist if it didn't play by the Chinese government's rules. That's something that's very different here in the U.S. And uh, that close relationship, I, I, I honestly think it's a bad thing. Um, allowing companies to kind of innovate and do their own thing as uh, as opposed to working to a template or working to integrate into the Chinese government and military systems allows American corporations to be much, much more flexible. But it does allow a certain level of investment that obviously any one of these big companies is going to have a lot more customers and a lot more revenue and a lot more business because they are tied so closely with the Chinese government. So they're much more stable, I guess, uh, in terms of kind of market dominance. So this article continue, uh, continues on. Uh, let's see. So facing America's slipping competitive, uh, competitiveness in this field, foreign governments and companies will, le will likely be pushed to let advanced Chinese systems into their societies. And well, hey, uh, the shaping of repressive or intrusive AI-driven techno technological environment, not to mention the possible passing of national and personal information to China. And despite the assurances of Chinese companies that they do not share with the Chinese government, Beijing's national security, cybersecurity, and national intelligence laws mandate that private corporations in China cooperate with authorities when ordered to, including providing private data. So obviously we're seeing a lot of this with uh, a completely different technology from AI. We're looking at uh, 5G and 5G networks and you know 5G antennas rolling out this futuristic advanced network is already creating a lot of tension between China and what the US is doing and more. I don't see artificial intelligence going any smoother than the current 5G rollout is. And as much as we don't want technology to become political, because the technology and the technology behind it, it just is, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's not politics that AI exists, but it's heading that way. So prepare for more of this. Uh, so the article ends up or ends with, uh, Assuming such an approach leads to an increase in American math abilities, there, uh, there will then have to be a national reckoning about the unwillingness of private American corporations to protect their intellectual property from China, as well as a push to keep U.S. trained mathematicians and engineers at home instead of selling their services through programs like China's Thousand Talents Plan. Winning the AI comp uh, competition begins by acknowledging how poorly we do in attracting and training Americans in math at all levels. Without getting serious about the remedy, the AI race may be lost as clearly as 2 plus 2 equals 4. There's a lot I don't agree about this whole thing. It, uh, it paints China in a very positive light. Uh, I think China has... They have a much bigger talent pool to pull from. I know that not all 1.4 billion Chinese uh, nationals are candidates for working in mathematics, but they have a much easier time of directing 
any number of people to say you are getting this degree like in america you can't imagine the u.s government saying ben you are going to get a phd in mathematics we've screened you we vetted you this is what you are going to do uh and obviously as an american i can say to heck with that i refuse and go off and earn my PhD in linguistics or, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever field that I wish to do. China has a much more uh, totalitarian type system. And I have heard of situations where they will take thousands of people and say, you are being trained to become mathematicians, scientists, chemists, so on and so forth. They will select people out of a lineup and force them into a field that they need. That's the benefits that China has in controlling its workforce. Um, but there's also, you know, there's a lot of bad things that China is doing. Well, you know, obviously, uh, there's a lot of bad things China's doing. But I truly do believe that America and their system is going to be infinitely better. And... Don't get me wrong. There has been a need for for STEM related degrees for as long as I've been doing as long as I've been doing Computer America and as long as I've been approached by by schools and universities. STEM, 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 STEM. It's crammed down. It's crammed down every student's throat to get a degree in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. Now, obviously, we, we have a very low enrollment, and of course, it gets lower and lower when it comes to PhD and master degrees and things like that, but that, every country is dealing with that, just because it is hard to attract people to that, and, you know, it is more difficult. It, it is a more difficult career path. Uh, America's got this, I guess is my bottom line, uh, to say that China has any kind of noticeable leadership in this field would be a disservice to all of the people going through university and learning in American institutions uh, to work in American in, uh, to work in American industries. So, um, yeah, I think that's all there is to it. And by the way, a lot of this came from again national interest, but. Let's see, I think this was also uh, published by Reuters. So there you go. Okay, there's that article. Um, man, that took a lot of time. I apologize. Went off on a little tangent. But it, it, it's, it's honestly a very good thing to talk about because it's not just a matter of, oh, you'll earn a lot of money if you uh, major in a STEM field. Uh, you know, it's not just, hey, you'll look really cool. It's that, hey, this is what the country needs. You know, maybe back in the day we needed manual labor. We needed, uh, you know, we needed construction workers to build the highway system. We needed, uh, well, hey, you know, we still need engineers and rocket scientists to to work on the moon program. Uh, we needed, you know, X Y Z. We're fat. You know, we are solid, solidly in the information age. We need computer scientists we need technician or uh, people who are well versed in computer science and uh in math really so we do need that no one's no one's doubting that it's just uh it's not as easy to do so the next one we're going to talk about and i like this one a lot internet speeds can be atrocious in rural places but it doesn't have to be, and I'm really happy when you see articles like this, when people take it into their own hands. Internet speeds were awful, so these rural Pennsylvanians put up their own wireless tower. This is the story I like to hear as opposed to burning down wireless towers. So Big Valley is, is a living postcard of Pennsylvania. Jet black buggies hug the shoulders of its long straight roads and lots of fields, lots of farmland, obviously rural. And hey, lots of Amish people. It is Pennsylvania after all. 
Check this out. The government couldn't help. Private suppliers have long said improved speeds were too costly to provide for such a sparsely populated area. So a group of mostly retirees banded together and took a frontier approach to a modern problem. They built their own wireless network using radio signals instead of expensive cable. Wondering why that wasn't an option to begin with. And this, by the way, from the Philadelphia Inquirer, saying that we, uh, quote, we just wanted better internet service up our valley. It was pretty simple. It was as simple as that. And they said that the nonprofit RBC services uh, anyone who can see the 100, uh, I'm sorry, they say anyone who can see the 120 foot tower, former ham radio tower, uh, its founders bought and erected on a patch of land that they leased from an Amish man around 1,900 feet on a mountain. Users pay an initial setup fee of about 300 bucks, a monthly service fee of about 40 to $75, depending on which speed you choose, ranging from 5 to 25 megabits per second. So 40 bucks for five, $75 for, for 25 megabits per second, and they have about 40 paying customers. Obviously, think about these numbers. Um, $75 a month times 40. So you're looking at, what is that, $3,000? Is somewhere around there? About $3,000 um, at most that they could be earning, and it's probably a lot less. But, you know, for those 40 customers, instead of getting the, oh, yeah, sure, we'll run internet out to your um, out to your house for the low, low price of a hundred thousand, seventy thousand dollars, whatever it costs for the equipment to be run to your house. Instead, they're actually able to get it to one another. It's pretty cool. Uh, let's see. So the Philadelphia suburbs had the high speeds. Uh, let's see. Um, they said that they tried the FCC and the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission and got nowhere, and they uh, they had to intervene with private providers. So let's see, let's go ahead and end this and just say that uh, yeah, they all had they all had something to say about how it went up and what some of the problems are. But it's pretty cool. They said that the signal can service a 15 mile radius. Fixed wireless systems are line of sight, meaning that users have to be able to see the tower from their residence in order to connect. Sometimes trees block it. So as long as you can see the tower from your house and you can get that direct line of sight, obviously it will degrade in different weather conditions. Hey, this is why cable companies do run cables out to your house, but it's better than nothing. And I'm sure it's a heck of a lot cheaper than what they were quoted from other people in 25 megabits per second. I mean, for rural Pennsylvania, where your options were satellite or probably nothing, 25 megabits per second is actually very, very impressive. And I'm sure to upgrade that wouldn't be too much at all. So pretty darn cool. I, I definitely enjoy stories like that. Uh, when cities and municipalities take it into their own hands to solve their network problems. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and continue on. Okay. How about we talk about Mac? Mac computers and a new ransomware going around. Uh, sometimes I like to bring up these articles just because some people seem to think that for some reason, Macs are immune to malware, which is not the case. Most malware is written for Windows operating systems. Because obviously, when you have a 95 to 5% market share, why would you write the code for 5% of the market as opposed to the 95% of the market? Most malware is not designed to be run on Mac. It's not because Mac is more complicated. It's not because Mac is more safe. It's simply because it's a smaller market share. Now, there's a new malware going around and you need to be you need to be careful make sure everything's updated saying that the first full-fledged mac ransomware uh surfaced only four years ago so they have a new one that uh, they have confirmed case uh, by k7 lab on tuesday about a new example of mac ransomware and that fact alone was significant it turns out though that the malware which researchers are now calling thief quest uh 
gets more in, it gets more interesting from there. In addition to ransomware, Thief Quest has a whole other set of spyware capabilities, allowing it to exfiltrate files from an infected computer, search the system for passwords and cryptocurrency wallet data, and run a robust keylogger to grab passwords, credit card numbers, and other financial information as a user types it in. So first things first, exfiltration of files. So that means that they have access to all the files on the computer, which they will send to somewhere else and save them. Uh, they're able to identify all the passwords in user data and cryptocurrency wallets. Uh, so yeah, pretty much everything that's worth anything is stolen. And even stuff that probably isn't worth anything is also stolen. Uh, the spyware component also lurks persistently as a backdoor on infected devices. Means that obviously you can boot your computer up, you can boot it down. It will pop back up as soon as you launch your computer. And it could be used as a launch pad for additional second stage attacks. Given that ransomware is so rare on Macs, this is a one-two punch, especially noteworthy. Uh, many Mac users are the creative types. They, you know, uh, a lot of them work on uh, copyrighted things. They work on movies, music, uh, television, things like that. And if any of that data can be stolen or, you know, sold in any mean, uh, sold to anyone, then, oh yeah, they're definitely going to steal it. So they said, looking at the code, if you split the ransomware logic from all the other backdoor logic, the two pieces make complete sense as individual malware, but compiling them together, you're kind of like, what? My current gut feeling, and by the way, this is all a quote from a principal security researcher at the Mac management firm. He said that my current gut feeling is that all of this is that someone basically has designed a piece of Mac malware that would give them the ability to completely remotely control an infected system. And then they also added some ransomware capability as a way to make extra money. So that even if you paid the ransomware, you got access to everything all over again, it would still run in the background and maybe, hey, six months later, they would reactivate it. You have to pay more money. Uh, you'd really have to make sure that you got every piece of this malware off of your machine because, you know, hey, uh, part of the software is, is allowing further attacks to happen. So, um, yeah, I think that's as far as we're going to take that. Obviously, malware is what malware does. If you want to know more, definitely check out and, uh, hey, have a good anti-malware system in place. You should definitely, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a toilet plunger. You want, you want one before you need one. You, you know what I mean? You want it there before you need one. So yeah, get some good anti-malware. Let's go ahead and talk about, yeah, we have time for like half a story, not even one full story. Um, a lot of these are like longer conversations that we could definitely have, but this one should be pretty quick. This one from Engadget. And iOS 14 is leading to a lot of revelations. iOS 14, for those of you who don't know, uh, it was revealed back at the Worldwide Developer Conference with Apple, saying that Apple and iOS apps, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, iOS operating system, will start to notify you when certain apps are reading certain kinds of data. And turns out one of those is, well, Reddit. Reddit, WhatsApp, and a number, and LinkedIn, a number of apps are doing this. Saying that the, clip, the clipboard privacy feature in iOS 14 is prompting more major developers to tone down their app's nosy behavior. Reddit told The Verge in a statement that it would fix code in its iOS app that copies clipboard data with virtually every keystroke, as yourspace.io co-founder Don Morton discovered, there's also a code path that post, uh, that post composing tool that checks for web links in the clipboard and suggests titles based on that link. It stressed that it, it does not store or send clipboard data and expected to fix, uh, I'm sorry, expected the fix to arrive by July 14th. Essentially, this is either lazy coding and they're using kind of a, like a workaround to add some kind of usability feature or much more likely it doesn't cost reddit 
or LinkedIn or any other service out there. It doesn't cost them anything to take data from you, the user. And if no one's going to call them on it until now, if no one's going to penalize them for it, then it's more of a matter of why wouldn't we than why should you know than why shouldn't we? Uh, as ZDNet reported, this came shortly after LinkedIn VP uh, promised a fix for a similar flaw in his iOS client that they found. And in this case, it stems from an equality check between the clipboard and what you've typed in a box. Berger said that when users expect, uh, you know, said that they should expect a fix, but he vowed a follow up once the solution was available in the LinkedIn app. Uh, so while they appear to be non malicious, they've seen several other apps, meaning that it's, you know, hey, the iOS clipboard is useful. So, yeah, uh, the detection of this in the iOS <coughs> is definitely useful. Uh, at, at the least, it could assure users by prompting developers to only gather clipboard info when necessary, it might also provide a security benefit by reducing the opportunities for intruders to grab sensitive information, especially from apps that share the clipboard with nearby Apple devices. Um, further privacy, good, and even if it's not straight up privacy, it at least allows you, the user, to know what is being collected from you. Uh, if there was ever to be a really big advancement in consumer privacy. I don't think it's going to be this whole, you know, no one no one knows anything about you or what you're doing. I think it's going to be more in the lines of you, the user, finally know what data is coming from you and how it's being used. That is the next frontier in data privacy and I'm all for it. So everyone, that's it. Thank you so much for tuning in to Computer America. Until next time, have a great day. ComputerAmerica.com. Everyone, have a good one. Bye-bye.